When I entered my 40s, it became really loud in my head to me. Like my life was on paper beautiful. I had a great relationship with my husband and our kid, running my private practice. And just this facet of my identity, my queerness really felt invisible. And it started feeling pretty toxic that it was that invisible. And needing to come out constantly just didn't feel good to me anymore. And I also wanted to pursue that aspect of myself and get to know that part of myself more. Sapphics and allies, you're listening to Queer Women Rising. That's women with an X because we are inclusive here. When we hear the stories of queer women who have gone before us, we see evidence that there's nothing we can't do. And yes, we can too. It's time for you to level up in life, in love, and step into your most authentic, abundant reality. You won't be the same after this episode. It's your turn to let go of good for greatness. Your best life is now loading. Let's rise. Let's rise. Let's rise. Let's rise. Let's rise. Let's rise. Coming out after 40, midlife, late in life, coming out whenever can feel like an existential crisis. This may be your queer awakening or simply a mindset shift when you realize, hey, I get to make my own decisions. I get to be aware of what I choose and who I choose and I don't choose this anymore. And sometimes choosing something different especially when it comes to coming out later in life is complicated, personally, financially, relationally. So let me tell you about my guest today on Queer Women Rising. When she entered her 40s, psychotherapist and coach Jen Berlingo was living what appeared to be a stable life, running a successful private practice, married to a devoted man and parenting their vibrant kid. But a fire burned deep within and she knew she couldn't suppress it. Jen set out to emerge as the most authentic version of herself, which led her to live more fully and step into her full queer identity. Jen Berlingo is a life coach, facilitator, best-selling award-winning author of Midlife Emergence, Free Your Inner Child. Sorry, Free Your Inner Fire. (laughs) That was just so automatic for me. Let me say that again. Jen wrote Midlife Emergence, Free Your Inner Fire. She serves as a steadfast guide for coaching clients worldwide as they move through profound transitions. Jen is also a licensed professional counselor, a nationally registered art therapist, and a master Reiki practitioner and visual visual artist. I'm so glad to have her here. For those of you who don't know, I came out at age 28-ish, 29. It was like a mix because I came out bi, then I came out lesbian. And coming out midlife or late in life can be really, really challenging and honestly traumatic. I lost a lot of people along the way. And so that's what I want to talk to Jen about today um, because I know she still has a relationship with her ex-partner or I'd like to hear about how that's working out for her. So Jen, if you are here live with me, send a little request to join the live show because everyone's ready to hear from you. I'm so excited to have you on. You will go ahead and just tap to request to join the live. In the meantime, I'm gonna go through the comments. If you're here, feel free to ask me any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Oh my goodness, so many of you here today. Thank you, Coach Priya. (laughs) Please marry me, so cute. Um, I got a message that says, Can you help me find a lesbian wife you're requesting them? Yes. (laughs) I actually just launched a dating platform for lesbians. So if you're interested in that, DM me the word dating and I will get you hooked up. It is so different than any dating app out there. It is based on high value connections and intentionality. So if you're interested in finding future wife material, DM me the word dating. I would love to help you. I love it. Someone just left 
uh, the woman who reached out earlier and said, can't we find advice? Uh, Morgan just left some advice saying, my advice is to take chances. My girlfriend thought she had no chance with me, but made a move anyway, and I liked her. Oh my gosh, that's so true. I love when people take chances because you may not be talking to someone you think is your type, and then they end up being like your person. They, you can end up having the best relationship ever. There's Jen. There she is. Let's get into it. I'm so excited today. I love talking to other women who have had late in life, midlife experiences with coming out because it's it's like our own little club of like, hey, we all went through that trauma. <laughs> hey, how are you? Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry, I didn't see your request right away. I was like, oh, that's okay. okay. I've been right here listening. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, good. Like going through the comments. It's good. We've got a lot of people here live. For everyone tuning in on the podcast, if you listen at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time live, you'll get to talk to me and my guests directly, which is so fun. But I hope you got to hear your introduction. I did. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. I want to hear your story. I've never heard your full story for the first time. So tell me, uh, like we were on a FaceTime call. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Give me the tea, um, girl. <laughs> I am, well, just contextually, I'm 48 right now. Um, and I've known I was queer since before I knew what queer was, like just being raised in, you know, the southeastern U.S. in the 70s and 80s. I didn't really have a frame of reference for queerness in terms of it being anything like a positive lifestyle that I could pursue, but I knew I had crushes on my friends, um, but I dated boys and eventually men. And um, yeah, and so I was out to myself, I would say like in college and to a few people, but then um, ended up dating a man um, who became my husband. And I was, I was with him for 21 years, married for 17. Um, we got divorced. We separated four years ago, got divorced three years ago. Um, but, you know, the day I met him, he knew I was queer. I thought I was bi at the time. Turns out, no. <laughs> Same experience. <laughs> yeah. I, that's a common one I hear from my clients um, as well. And I think that I, yeah, I just figured that because I was like, oh, I'm dating, you know, boys, men, so I must be bi, even though I know I'm attracted to women. Um, but when I entered my 40s, um, which is what I call like the midlife emergence rather than a midlife crisis, which we can talk about, um, it became really loud in my head to me. Like my life was on paper, beautiful. I had a great relationship with my husband and our kid, um, running my private practice. I was in the Bay Area of California at the time. And um, just this facet of my identity, my queerness really felt invisible and it started feeling pretty toxic that it was that invisible um, to others. Um, my close friends knew and my husband knew, but it was like, I don't know how I'm going to live this out in my life. Like it really felt like um, being perceived as heterosexual and being needing to come out constantly um, just didn't feel good to me anymore. And I also wanted to pursue that aspect of myself and get to know that part of myself more. And so I talked with him about that and we opened our marriage slowly. Um, we had, you know, marriage counseling that was focused on open marriage. Um, we read all those books. We, you know, kind of tiptoed into it. Um, and after a few years of that, um, of experimenting with that kind of just emotionally more than in practice, like I wasn't dating anyone yet. I did meet um, and start to date the woman that I'm still with. Uh, we've been together almost five years now. Um, and so that there was overlap there in trying to negotiate that, but it became pretty clear um, a couple of months at least into our relationship that for my ex-husband and I, Craig is his name, that wasn't the way we wanted marriage to look and that wasn't the way we wanted to look. And we realized that in our wedding vows, we had vowed to each other to let each other be the most free expressions of ourselves. And in keeping with our wedding vows, we were like, well, to do that actually would mean to separate and divorce and it's time to do something else and have our relationship and our family take a different shape. So that's what we did. Just to not... pause really yeah. quick. So, like, how... so you tried polyamory is, is what you're saying. 
right? Yeah. Okay. And it was going to be like this equal relationship, like a triad. Was that what y'all are going for? No, um, it was more, it wasn't like for the three of us to be in relationship. It was for me to have experiences with women. Okay. Uh, he at the time wasn't interested in dating other people, but was very supportive of me exploring this. And yeah. I thought, okay, I do need to explore this part of myself. Yeah. And yeah. Um, with his support, that felt really safe. Like we kept our communication open. Um, and it felt like a really wonderful way to even, I don't know, explore that. And actually, right before, um, I saw like a month before I met my girlfriend and started dating her, I had an emergency appendectomy. And um, this is just kind of a funny story. Like while they gave me the um, sedation drug, and it was like waiting to take effect. And I'm in there with all these nurses and with Craig. And I'm like, I hope I don't die. I'm like being dramatic because I'm being rushed into like emergency surgery. I'm like, I can't, I can't die. I haven't even had sex with a woman yet. And he was like, it's okay. We'll make that happen for you. <laughs> and the nurses are like, what? And then that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> I was out. Yeah, it's <laughs> like so something I would have said. Yeah. Oh my God. Sure, oh my yeah, God. Who knows what the nurses were talking about after that. But I was like, and he's like, we'll make it happen. It's okay. <laughs> so oh my yeah, he God. was very... Oh my supportive and is still my best friend um but I yeah love to hear that so the man that I dated before like I left and everything we're still like friendly mm -hmm. and like it's people are like shocked by that so yeah but when you have a man so like hey go figure this out for you like that that is real unconditional love it really and is. yeah did you feel like looking back like can you identify like oh I was never in love this was just like a friendship or do you feel like at one point you did enjoy like sex with a man because for me I look back and I'm like oh I just enjoyed orgasms not sex with a man like, <laughs> yeah I mean I definitely was in love with him in the sense of I love a lot of people you know just like there are a lot of forms of love I didn't know um, what it could be like to be in a romantic relationship with a woman. So for me, I was like, oh, this is what it is. And I also was sort of like, I mean, we had connected intimate sex, but it wasn't, I guess I didn't get what all that was, the fuss was about with sex, honestly, until I had sex with a woman. I'm like, oh, this is what everyone is feeling, that I wasn't experiencing deep in my core before. Um, so it felt like, oh, I make sense now. Sex makes sense now. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, sex and my relationship with him was bad, but it just wasn't what I, yeah. I didn't know any different, really, you know? So, um, and I do love him. He is the father of our kid and we co-parent and, you know, there are challenges, of course, with that, but we um, are really still communicative with each other. He lives right down the street, you know? Um, yeah, That's so amazing how does your partner now like are, is she okay with with you and craig i are yeah. her are the pronoun she her I just she sure I'm getting it right. is she her yeah okay. um and she is she's super um supportive of our closeness and just when we we have like family dinners every week together um just me and craig and our kid our kid's non-binary so uh they use they them pronouns and yeah that we do that on Wednesday nights and she's like, sometimes she's there, but usually just the three of us and she's totally cool with that and does her own thing during that time. So it's great that I have a partner who's supportive and not threatened by the closeness of that relationship. Um, yes. And she knows it's not a romantic relationship any longer. It's really like a, it, he's family, you know? Yeah, no, I get that. I've had exes who like hated that I was still friendly with my yeah. ex and like that's just not gonna fly because i'm like he's like my family yeah like, totally we were together for so long okay so we have a, a comment from wonder woman 321 did you end up with the first person you were with the first woman you were with can you confirm that i did um wow. yeah and she isn't the person that i would consider like my catalyst and i write about this in my book the whole story and it's juicy but like the person that i fell in love with and thought that you know it was like loud enough in me to bring that to my husband at the time was my best friend and so um and I write about that in the book and she um she's queer she's married to a woman and we've been close for like 22 years or something and so I felt like our relationship for me was becoming an attraction as well and so that 
was something that I worked through um, in the beginning of kind of this whole midlife <laughs> emergence situation. And she and I are still best friends and um, got through that period. I was open with her about it. And um, yeah, she was very supportive and understanding about that, but we were never together. So um, yes, I then when I met Diana, um, we started dating and I'm still with her. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Well, what, it sounds like you've had so much support. Was there anyone who wasn't supportive or like what was the biggest challenge for this midlife emergence? Yeah, um, definitely there are. I feel like huh, the way that I say that, like I have definitely a group of supportive friends. Um, all my closest friends are therapists. So that's a perk because we all <laughs> train together. <laughs> yes. The therapy program. So that's fun. But um I felt like it was sort of the final frontier to bring this um, news or, you know, the development of this in my life to my family of origin, um, to my mom specifically and uh, to my stepdad, but mostly my mom. And I had to be far enough along in knowing the kind of shift and transition I was making that Craig and I were separating before I brought that to her because I knew that what she would respond with, like the fear of, um, my life being more difficult, the fear of divorce for my child. I already had those voices in my head because she installed them. <laughs> so I felt like I don't actually need those reinforced. Um, so I was really careful in, you know, bringing that up with her and wrote her a long letter, let her have time to digest the change before I was in conversation with her because I knew it would be somewhat of a shock um, because Craig and I had a really great relationship. So, um, but she knew I had come out to her in my early 20s okay. um and it was always disregarded like like oh well Same. you're with craig so it doesn't matter Same. <laughs> really yeah, yes it was, it was interesting and, and minimizing so i'm like oh okay i guess that doesn't matter because i'm not living that life but i am queer i don't know so i mean i don't know the gender of your partner doesn't determine your sexuality so it felt um hard that that wasn't acknowledged i guess yeah um, yeah, that's, that's that like that a with you? great, powerful statement. The gender of your partner does not determine your sexuality. And I think someone needs to hear about today to feel so validated if they've never gotten that experience. I've I've heard so many women say, but I've never had sex with a woman. So I, I'm not like, I might not be, bi. I'm like, no, like if you are feeling these things, like you are, bi, well, you are what you say you are. You, right, are what exactly. you, identify. <laughs> you know yourself the yes. best. So you know what you're feeling. Yeah. Yes. That's what I tell everyone. Any, any gender expression. I'm like, you are what you say you are end of discussion. Totally. Like that is really? it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, wait, what was your question? It was, did I experience, wait, I forgot already. <laughs> oh yeah. Did, did you, um, what did I say? Oh, oh about was, my mom, like minimizing yeah. it. Yeah. I love her. We're so close now, but I had like hinted coming out things early on and she'd say stuff like, oh, it's kind of weird that you'd bring this one friend home from college all the time. And like, mm -hmm. I knew you must have had a crush on her but you also had a boyfriend so i didn't think right. anything of it but the way you were interacting with her was weird and back then i was literally like in high school and college i this is so embarrassing but i mean if someone's gonna dig it up one day i'll dig it up for myself <laughs> i literally had the inequality sign for gay marriage as my profile picture because mm -hmm. that's like the how i was raised here in the south like mm being against gay marriage and here i am now an out and proud lesbian and i'm like if someone yeah. takes it away from me we're gonna fight <laughs> but <laughs> yes yes yeah my mom and i are close to we um i mean that period was hard it was like an adjustment i think for her and in our relationship and still in some ways is she's you know um of a different generation still living in a pretty conservative town um still going to church all of these things that are yeah. giving her different sort of messages than I'm giving her. So, um, but she is loving and supportive in the way that she can be, but there's limitation yeah. there, but we're close. I think for me, my parents seeing like, oh, you're in this experimentation phase where I was still with him yet trying to date women. They like, yeah. didn't respect it. They did not trust it. Mm -hmm. And like, I get it's one person it's one thing for like getting your parents and like southern religious people to accept you as gay but getting them to accept you as gay and like 
also dating multiple people like it was really hard for them yeah and i have polyamorous friends and i'm like i love them and i respect them but then once i tried that i knew very quickly when i fell in love with the woman i'm not polyamorous i yeah, immediately was like <laughs> if you touch same. her you go die yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'm the same i'm like i don't really think i have the attachment style to do open relationship um at all but I, I mean, I respect it. I know it's a valid relationship style. And I know a lot of people who have really awesome relationships like that, but it's not for me. It did feel like something that was, um, you know, we were trying our best to yeah. keep our marriage together because we are so close. And we were like, okay, what if, what if this happened? What if we tried this? So, um, but yeah, it just became really clear quickly that that wasn't the form we wanted our love yeah. to take i get it so what yeah what was the moment that you brought to your then husband and mm -hmm. you're like holy shit this is a crisis like was it a slow conversation where he was accepting 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 and then maybe he was sh shocked or was he like ready for it because my ex-boyfriend was like okay 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 and then shocked mm. and everything he had promised me like hey i'm gonna help you like for six months if we'd ever break up because you worked for me for so long i would help you get an apartment all that stuff was thrown out the window mm. and i was like out on the street oh, <laughs> so like gosh, what I'm was sorry. it like for you oh it's okay it made me stronger <laughs> but <laughs> yeah totally um yeah for for us when I first brought the conversation to him, he wasn't surprised because he has known my sexuality all along. And he's like, okay, we'll work through this. And he was, you know, supportive of that. And I would say that the, that was a pretty steady thing throughout. And the shock parts, I think, came later when I began to date Diana. Mm. And he saw that what I was seeking was not like a side chick. <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, it wasn't just to have sexual experiences. It was actually like, I am having an emotional relationship with this person that's actually really deep. And I don't know that he was necessarily prepared for the level of intimacy that was involved there. Um, and so I don't know that he was shocked about it because he knows me and he knows how I love and how I really need a deep emotional connection with someone in order to be physical. Um, so it wasn't like I was just gonna hook up right. with random people and so i think that that was the part where he was just like oh that's what this means like i'm sharing your heart with someone too and um and i think that that was hard to get through uh yeah. for both of us yeah no i, I think it'd be hard for anyone i think you're very lucky to have like a partner who walks so many steps with you up yeah. until that point Me so too. that's amazing it's, but well. it's been a couple decades so it's, and then i realized that that's rare um i work with a lot of women who are coming out later in life in my coaching practice and you know some do have supportive partners some are in you know emotionally abusive relationships some are too afraid to tell like there's a whole gamut that that can run and i realized that that piece of my story i feel really fortunate um about his character and who he is and continues to be and um you know when we divorced the financial stuff was you know all like in writing so what you're talking about with your ex-boyfriend it isn't like that he's quite generous and just does what needs to be done and we share yeah. a child so it's like there's child support and those sorts of things so good yeah. i'm so glad you're supported i hear from women all the time like that they're so afraid to come out yeah. because they don't know that they'd have the support or how to even start those hard conversations and i'm yeah. sure that's something you coach on right Definitely. I do feel like um, there is this level of safety, security, familiarity of this like safe base that a marriage can provide, especially a long term one. And to let go of that for the mystery of who knows what is coming is something that I work with people on all the time. This, um, you know, stagnation versus generativity sort of thing. It's like it's the stage of life life of midlife, Eric Erickson, a psychologist in the 50s said that that's sort of the question that we're facing. So the stagnation part of like, that feels actually like safety to a lot of people. And it, it really is in a lot of ways, like financially, it can be and just security wise, um, and future wise, it's like, you know, what that future is going to look like. So um, it's like the devil, you know, and the devil you don't know, or, you know, there are a lot of ways of saying that. But when I wrote my book, I talked to over 100 women about this idea of um, 
risk taking and going toward something that's unknown. And all of them said that they like literally 100% of them said that they were more prone to taking risks at this stage of their life and going for the generativity, the growth producing, the evolution type thing than they were toward the safety, familiarity piece. A lot of people fall somewhere in between, but um, wow. yeah, it's really hard to take a leap when you don't know what you're leaping toward exactly, which is I think why some people overlap or like don't actually leave till they have another relationship. Um, and some people just know and need to. And, and there's such a reality of maybe not being financially secure after that, um, which is why I also offer like a scholarship, like partial scholarship sort of things with my coaching. Because I know that the predicament that a lot of women are in where it's like, this is the kind of support I need. And I don't know if I can afford it, but it's like they need to not be alone and walking that path. So yeah, I feel like risk taking wow. and doing that and finding the safe, secure base inside yourself. Um, it's an adjustment. And I think that that's part of what that transitional period can be like. It really can. Yeah. And I know for me, it took, I don't know how long it takes your clients, but I know for me, just to be real, up until I went on my vacation this year, which where I started my eat, pray, gay, love journey, like in May, <laughs> yeah. I hadn't really like slowed down. Mm -hmm ever because I was just build my business build my business build my business yeah. and um yeah it was really scary in the beginning and then I started getting super successful and I was like oh okay like I don't want to slow down and like just kept up maybe a, a little workaholicism mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and I finally like got settled in my soul and in my spirit and like have the systems in place where I don't have to do that anymore and it's it feels like a miracle but I will say that first year and a half mm -hmm. felt like the scariest thing the it scariest is, it can be so scary yeah what is that like for you in terms like personally professionally with risk taking and like moving from something that might feel safe to something that who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i i will say this i'm 32 when this happened to me i was 29 mm -hmm. that was my like would you call it midlife emergence at yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah you're more in quarter life maybe <laughs> yeah quarter yeah. life well, yeah. it, it was, I'm very blessed that whenever I was married to a man, mm -hmm. I did not have a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm very blessed that when I dated a man, I did not have a child. Now, mm -hmm. I hope if I want to have a child one day, I'm able to have a child because yes. I'm confused at why I never accidentally got pregnant. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> um, I think if I had a child or children, this would have been a lot more challenging for me. And maybe I would have stayed longer. Mm -hmm. I think there's this part of me that would have always jumped ship like even mm -hmm. if I had two babies in my hand mm -hmm. I would have always been thinking like how can I sneak the neighbor in through the garage to have sex later like mm -hmm. I would never be able to just be straight there's there's no way yeah and I don't mean that to say like oh I'm like promiscuous or whatever but at times with my ex-boyfriend like I had relationships mm -hmm. like where I was trying to get there yeah. like what will it be like yeah. the first time with a girl so eventually I just, it was too much. I couldn't take it and I did jump ship. Mm -hmm. So I know I do, I'm willing to take risk. I'm definitely willing to take, take risk for myself right now. I think it's only fair for me to say that if I was 40 and I had a even more luxury lifestyle, I was afraid to leave. I don't know mm -hmm. if I would have done it mm -hmm. because I care about safety. I am like so Torian. Yeah, I care about stability and safely safety. And I, would, I feel like I was like, I'm young enough to do this now. It's now or never, which is such a lie. Mm -hmm. I know that being on the other side, I'm like, it's worth it no matter what yeah. age you are. It really is. But I can see how it would be really scary for people. I mean, as far as business, I'm willing to take major risks. Like I just launched a new dating platform and like oh, put cool. a lot of money and time into that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm willing to take all the risks. Like, but 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 not gambling like i'm researched i'm a social media strategist i know how to sell things very well yeah so yeah i'm willing to take calculated risks totally. so yeah. and i think that that's what it's about and i mean just having the support on board it's it is it's hard to leave like a lifestyle we don't actually have cultural support for that sort of thing for tuning into our own inner voice and our own authenticity and acting on that and like when you're in midlife, the stakes feel so high um, because you can be settled into careers and mortgages and kids and your parents are aging and, you know, you might be taking care of elders. And at that stage of life, we don't really have um, like roadmaps or models or cheerleaders to help us unfurl into a more expansive and maybe true way of mm -hmm. being. 
So <laughs> we yeah. have you now. So that is why I wrote my book. That is why I, I do this work really. Um, just so that people who are like, well, I, you know, I'm a recovering good girl. I'm a former people pleaser. I checked all the boxes. I made this life that I should want. And then I'm sitting here unsatisfied and saying like, is this it? Like, mm-hmm. I don't feel the way I thought I would feel with all of the accomplishments or with the nice house and the career and the kids and the husband, there's something else. And so some of the people I work with um, aren't necessarily grappling with sexuality or gender. They're, you know, needing a career change or needing, maybe needing a divorce, maybe um, other types of life changes that happen at midlife. But I'd say the bulk of my clients are people who are questioning and curious about their sexuality and exploring their queerness um, because they weren't meant like able to in the time in which we grew up. And um, some of them have children who are coming out um, in Gen X and they're coming out as queer or non-binary or, you know, all sorts of things that they're feeling like an envy about the type of exploration Mm -hmm. their child is able to have and an openness that their child and their friends are able to have that they weren't able to have. So I've seen that as well and being like, oh, you know, my kid came out. That's no big deal. I wish I had been able to explore that. And I think that that can be an impetus um, at this stage of life for my clients who have like teenagers. So that like breaks my heart, honestly. Like yeah. I didn't, I never thought of that. Cause I don't, I don't know anyone who's had that experience yet, but holy, wouldn't that be something to wake up and be like, I'm so glad I can support you, but like be harboring the mm-hmm. secret. Oh my God. And I, yeah. I have dated women who were in the closet, like literally wouldn't come out because their parents were aging. Like you said, they didn't want to mm-hmm. tell their children because they were afraid their children based on their beliefs or their, their child's husband's belief that they'd never be able to see their grandchild, like crazy. There's all these reasons yeah. people keep it inside. And one of the biggest ones is compulsive heterosexuality. Like yeah. I think both of us thinking we were bi is just like major. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally cop it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I really hope that our generation's the last to have to deal with combat, but I doubt that that's true. Um, yeah, no, we're not there yet. No, <laughs> we are not. But yeah, it just is so sad when like we're not acknowledged for sexuality or gender. It can create, you know, such a sense of like disconnection from the self and a whole other host of mental health issues. And it's like a patriarchal society that expects that heterosexuality is the norm or even you know, asking a little girl like, oh, do you have a boyfriend? Or you're going to be knocking him dead when you grow up or, you know, whatever. It, it drives like, me crazy to hear that. Too. Yeah. It's yeah. I have nieces and nephews and I love them. <laughs> but like it, if I'm anywhere and someone's like, oh, look, she has a little boyfriend because she went and held a little boy's hand. I'm like, don't like, it, like, let's take the fact that I'm the lesbian auntie out of this. Let's not sexualize kids. Let's right. not like, eat. they're not thinking about that. They're yeah. not thinking and, about that. And we just put that onto them with the expectation and it feels, yeah, it's just, it's so compulsory. And then that means that queer people have to come out, which I don't even like that term because it's like saying that it's not the norm. Yeah. And it's, I would rather say I'm inviting people in Ooh. to my experience rather than like, I need to come out of some closet where you know, I had to hide like, but I do think that there is that. I mean, that is the reality of what my life was like. But I know that those are closets that like my kid doesn't even know, <laughs> you know, like, like they like them and their friends are like, why are you coming out of something? Like, what is that about even? And I'm just so relieved. That gives me so much hope. I love I love that. And it is sad that it's not probably going to be the next generation that's fully clear of it but yeah you're breaking the chain for your family yeah and that's amazing and a lot of people are it makes me yeah feel happy about that and i know it's regional in a lot of ways too but um yeah you know how did you come as... up with the reemergence, like instead of midlife crisis like what made you come up with that yeah well i mean midlife crisis midlife is defined as 40 to 65 like in psychology right and i um oh stereotypically a midlife crisis centers like a male experience and the tropes of, you know, getting the red sports car and having the affair with the younger, what, like all of that stuff. And that it doesn't have to be a crisis or an emergency. So I changed that word to emergence because it's defined as Mm -hmm. the process of coming into view or becoming exposed after being previously concealed. So it's like an emerging out of like anything that was repressed or hidden 
coming up and out, which is actually what the challenge of this time period is psychologically. So it can be reframed as emergence, like of emerging our more authentic selves um, after we have like the courage to challenge or even shed some of the cultural conditioning and interjects that we lived into in the first half of life. It's like, now that we've done all that and maybe it doesn't feel as satisfying as we thought it did, like reorienting, like what you were saying about slowing down and getting quiet with the self and like not using the busyness and all of that to distract away from that inner voice. And so what I like to take people through and in the first chapter of my book, every chapter has like prompts at the end, like journaling and art and ritual and ceremony for people. But the first one's like, how do you even slow down enough to hear the inner voice? Like, what is it whispering or shouting to you? And maybe your body is giving you clues into that. Um, but yeah, it just felt for me, like when I entered my 40s, the word emergence felt right. It felt really um, just on on par with like what I was experiencing, experiencing about that decade, that's sort of the liminal space or the like waiting room between the first and second act of life yeah. where you're like, okay, now I'm going into the second act. Like, how do I want to architect it to be what I need it to be? And um, so that it feels aligned and congruent from the inside to how I'm living on the outside. Um, so yeah, I just felt like it needed a reframe. Like that crisis word isn't, uh, it doesn't show the opportunity, I guess, in it. And it's not to say that it isn't hard. It's one of the most freaking hard things actually to decide to be, and not even decide, but to acknowledge that you might want a different kind of life or that you're someone that other people aren't expecting you to be. And so there is a lot of, you know, people have feelings about that. <laughs> and, you know, they, there's impact on other people, like yeah. you were saying, like, but yeah. I love I love it, especially because I don't know if you know this about me, but I only date older women. So I'm oh, into yeah. women like 45 plus uh -huh. to like 55. That's my sweet spot. Like it just yeah. always been attracted to that since 25. I like let that. And it's weird. Like I am like a solid like 48 to 53. Wow. Since I was 25. Okay. Like that's like okay. what I like. I don't know why, <laughs> except that I can think that like when you get to that age, if you've come out and you're you're sure of who you are mm -hmm. you will look into your purse and find zero fucks like mm -hmm. you're just who you are you're like i'm all out of fucks i am just me yeah. i'm proud to be me and they've obviously gone through that midlife emergence already yeah or at least they're on the tail end of it um the unhealthy ones are like not accepting that they're gonna go through <laughs> it and i'm just like okay i might as well be dating someone 25 i'm not doing this but yeah um yeah so i think that that work and are willing to really look at yeah look at themselves and be true to who they are um and i get why some people don't like maybe they know that inside and then they're not bringing that forward whether it's for safety reasons or for yes. you know i mean like you said like financially like there's so many reasons that sometimes people can't come out or um you know live in that truth which is so unfortunate and i think it's so why visibility why you doing what you do is so important um just to actually have that visibility and for people to know this is a possibility. This is a lifestyle. Like you will be okay. There are people who can support you through this. So yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. And it was so sad to date women who were that age and in the closet. And like, yeah. I don't recommend it. Um, yeah. If they're literally telling you they're too afraid to come out, like, because you'll never be able to have like that open relationship if you're craving that right right but i mean it could be really romantic for you to both figure it out and both be in the closet until you're both ready to come out <laughs> i have seen that happen too <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah there's, there's no right or wrong like, just be open with your partner where you're at totally i agree yeah uh, oh my gosh okay so during your 40s you pivoted your business completely from in person to doing coaching to women non-binary people around the world yeah. like what prompted that because that's a huge change i love it as an online entrepreneur who helps yeah. women grow their coaching businesses but like totally. what helped you what what triggered that idea well yeah I'd been practicing. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor um, in why well, I was in the state of California and now in Colorado because I made a move. And with your counseling license, you're only able to see people in the state. And I maintain my license, but I don't practice as a psychotherapist or counselor anymore. I'm a nationally registered art therapist using art with people. But I decided to pivot to coaching because um, 
pandemic, first of all, um, had us all at home anyway. And so a few, like in 2020, I started seeing people more online. And then at the same time, I was writing my book um, and I was right. I didn't even know I was writing my book. I was writing snippets of my story as it was evolving and putting it on Instagram. And I got hundreds of comments and DMs saying, me too. Oh my God, this should be a book. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe. So I started writing all of that and started working with women who were um, working on their sexuality and maybe wanting to explore that or leave their marriage or have open relationships. And I saw a need for that. And I was like, I really want this to be accessible to more than just people in my state or in my neighborhood. Um, so I stopped practicing as a therapist and I did take some coaching training, but a lot of my therapeutic training just translates pretty well, um, having done that for 20 years. So I, um, yeah, started, I pivoted to coaching and I like the freedom of that too, in the sense of, um, as a therapist, it's kind of weird to put a like memoir out there that bears your soul. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like maybe yeah. TMI, but as a coach, actually, I feel like sharing who I am and my experience has actually led people to, um, you know, accept their own a little more. And I hear that a lot from people like, thanks for giving me the courage, like by being as raw and honest as you were, I know that I can do that. And I think that, um, yeah, I have more freedom to do that in a coaching approach than I did um, in a like counseling approach. That makes sense. That makes sense. I've coached a few uh, like lesbian coaches who are therapists mm -hmm. as well and mm -hmm. it's such a great thing for their business because you guys have so much freedom and actual scalability you can impact so many more people's lives than you could just taking one client at a time one client right. at a time right. if you have like courses and right. group programs yeah. um what about your your book like you keep talking about it it's like a memoir but it's also got exercises yeah. like yeah. i i love i'm geeking out on the organization explain so, what it's like totally. to read it because it's your story but it's also like helping them figure out theirs it's both um the genre is called a teaching memoir and it is basically a combination of memoir and personal growth book which are the two kinds of books i like to read so i was like oh i, I can write them together um so the bulk of it really is my story and it's a pretty raw open tale of that i'm not the heroine in, in the story i wrote it as it was happening not like and it's tied up with a bow and all pretty which still hasn't happened yet um so it really takes people through a journey. And in the 12 chapters, each one is like a theme that is common in midlife, whether you're working through something like I was with um, sexuality or if it's any other kind of transition. So I tell my story and then I talk about it also from a more of a professional, like coaching therapeutic perspective, um, talking maybe about attachment or about different things that have to do with that. And then at the end of each of the 12 chapters, 13, 13 chapters <laughs> I was nice. like oh, I have 12 I have 13 I like odd numbers um at the end of each of the 13 chapters I invite the reader into their own and in self-inquiry work like through journaling prompts art prompts as I'm an art therapist and want to do that you know in different media um and in personal ritual and ceremony ideas like creating I have people create a midlife emergence sort of alter in the beginning and then work with different things as they're going through so um, you can take or leave any of the prompts. It's like a buffet of options, but I like to have that for different learning styles or different ways that people like to explore. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the format of it. Um, but it reads like a story and then it has those sections. I've talked with a lot of readers who've read through and not done the prompts and then gone back and done all of them. You know, if they just want to do that. And I created an audio book uh, as well that I read so that you can just hear me tell the story um, also. So I love audiobooks. Okay, where can they get this amazing book that is going to be an exercise and your story? Yeah, it's available anywhere you buy books online, or you can ask for it in your library or bookstore, and they can order it for you if they don't already have it. Um, Amazon has it in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Um, Bookshop.org is a great place to support. So yeah, any of those places, if you want an autograph copy, um, you can go to my website and I can sign it and you know personalize it for you and send it out myself oh, so um yeah there are a bunch of options for where to find it and um yeah my website's just my name jenberlingo.com and you can also find out about my individual coaching and group coaching programs i have a new one opening i just opened enrollment or applications yesterday oh. for it and it's starting in september in two months so that's a midlife emergence group um so if you need you know 
to be in a group of other women who get it. Um, I, this is the fourth time I've run it and it's wow. such a beautiful program each time. Um, just the way that the cohort comes together. So mm. just, yeah, that's available now as well. So, and I have a bunch of online programs and things. So all of that's there. I love <laughs> that support. they, they're going to have so much support. Now you don't have to like rush your cell part. Like I want people to know where to go to get the, yeah. the help that they need. Like if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, Jen, I'm coming out or I'm afraid to come out. What would be the thing you recommend other than the book? We know the book's going to yeah. be amazing for them, but what would be like the coaching or the course? Where would be the first place to go? Yeah. If they are still kind of questioning um, whether or not they can or what this means inside and like keeping that in a couple different things um, like individual coaching with me, I think a lot of people um, who join a group, I have some that are like, I'm a little hesitant to say this out loud to other people, especially strangers, like wanting more of that safety of a one-on-one -on -one confidential connection. Yeah. I feel like for me, it was so important. I had a coach as I was moving through this myself. And it was like, yes, I talked to my best friend. Yes, I talked to my husband. But having that objective person and having someone who's walked that path and even if everyone's path is unique, I feel like it's just so important to have someone in your corner. Um, and the way that I do coaching is like, we do have, you know, in-person sessions, but I also have, they have access to me through Voxer and email all the time. So it's like, I'm right there. If you're like on a walk or driving home from work and you're like, oh my God, this came up today, they can share that and I'll respond. So it feels like, yeah, having a coach in your back pocket, um, so that, and also I have a self-paced online program called Queer Emergence. Okay. And it is something where it's not live with me, but there are videos and then different resources and prompts and things people can move through to like explore their sexuality and or gender. Um, and that's just six modules and it's um, yeah, only $97, I believe right now. Um, yeah, so I have, I have different programs on my site for people. So that's one that is sort of like putting a, you know, baby toe into the water and exploring some of the language around that and some of the resources that are already available out there. Um, yeah. yeah. So those would be maybe some starting points. Thank you for sharing. I can think back to, I was literally getting my Botox one day and my girl that does my skin is not a lesbian. At least I don't think she's anything other than straight. <laughs> But she was like, Sophia, because I was exploring and I was like opening the relationship with the man, blah, 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 to try to figure it out before mm -hmm. I came out as a lesbian. And she was like, have you read Untamed by Glennon Doyle? Yes. <laughs> and I was like, no, I haven't. She was like, I'm telling you, you have to read this book. And I don't like, and I don't really like take people seriously. Everyone has a book recommendation yeah. or whatever. But I can feel it in my bones, like, your book is going to change people's lives the way oh, that, like, and it's different, but also, like, the impact that, that hers had on me, I know that's going to be something that yours is going to do, because hers doesn't, I love her, God bless her, I but do her too. doesn't have the exercises, and she isn't, a, doesn't have that therapist background, so I imagine yours is going to be, like, even more effective for people reading not only the story, but then getting those exercises, and I keep the book displayed on my shelf, and I used mm -hmm. to keep extra copies to give to the women I would date who are still like, oh, I don't know what I am. Totally. Or <laughs> I love Glennon Doyle, and I love Untamed. I um, was writing my book when her book came out, and I read it in, like, the first day. It, I mean, Amazon, like, delivered it because I had pre-ordered because I love her. And I read it and I was like, shit, she wrote the book I'm writing. But I realized she didn't because we all have very different stories. We do. Um, but I got to meet Glennon <gasps> in January and give her my book um, yes. at no Girls Just Want a Weekend at Brandy Carlisle's. Like, um, yeah, it, which was amazing. I totally was fangirling and barely could talk. Um, my girlfriend was like, you know, Jen can't talk right now. But <laughs> I was like, no. So we talked a, a little bit. She was so gracious and wonderful. So I don't know if she's read it. I don't know. She said, I'm going to go read right now and like walked away with it. But who knows? Um, but yeah, I'm a huge fan of hers. And I mentioned her in my book. Um, yeah, she has some amazing, like there are a few quotes of hers that I just really keep um, close to me that I really relate to um, yeah. a lot of that book. So yeah, my book is similar in a similar vein um, yeah. to that, but it does have the 
exercises and stuff as well, like you said. Yeah, I think it's going to be like something that helps people so much because I know like I read it and I was like, okay, wait, like I don't know how to sort through my thoughts now. And so yeah. having something that you wrote where it's like, oh my God, I get to hear this experience step by step from someone else really parallel my whole life to those steps and then now have these exercises that's going to be invaluable it it feels almost like a coaching program and the cost of a book yeah because you're getting to hear that <laughs> it's, it's amazing yeah. yeah so if anyone wants to go grab jen's book uh it's linked in your bio correct it is yes okay um, midlife emergence yeah you can go to my bio and there's everything there on my amazing link. Thank you for sharing your time with us and your story. Is there anything you'd want to leave, like one last word of encouragement for someone who may be, if I said, if I was 20 years later, I'd be so nervous <laughs> yeah, right, to right. jump the ship. But if you're speaking just to her, what would you say? I would say that a couple things, like it's more important to not abandon yourself. Like when you're scared of abandoning someone else or a family, that modeling of, staying with yourself and staying true to yourself and modeling for your children if you have them uh for your friends for whomever is watching it's like being true to yourself is going to ripple out and give other people the courage to be able to be true to themselves too i think it's a contagious thing integrity um so i know that it's scary um i've lived how scary it can be and i mean even in the best of circumstances but i don't have any regrets about staying with myself and just like not abandoning who I am because like, like that's, you know, we have this one life that we get to have and remember, and there's like juiciness to like ring dry from it. So if you yeah. have that feeling of like, Oh my God, I'm not going to ever be able to fully be myself. You, um, you definitely can, it's never too late to. So just, yeah. Maybe that's so a lot good. of things to say. No, <laughs> that's what I would. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you with. so much. It's yeah. beautiful having you here and your story. And it's it's it was so like nostalgic because it parallels mine so much. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah it's so good so. to learn more about you. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be on here with you and to chat with you and get to know you. It's been great. So welcome. And for anyone listening who's come over from Jen, hi, I'm Sophia Splino. I came out at. 28 by 29 lesbian and i just launched a dating platform for queer women who are ready to find that future wife their lifelong partner and if that's you dm me the word dating so i can get you hooked up it's a very tight community and it is different than any other dating platform out there so mm, i love that thanks for yes. making that <laughs> thank you i look forward to seeing you inside it's so funny because it is for women seeking monogamy but like I tell everyone, I have nothing against polyamory because I thought, I truly thought I'm polyamorous. I like you, your whole story mm -hmm. is so parallel. I was like trying to not let go of my best friend who is this man. Right. And like, I totally get it. But this, this is for women who are like, you know, you want to live and die with a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if that's you, DM me the word dating. I cannot wait to have you inside. And thank you so much, Jen, for sharing your story. It's going to touch the what I know. Oh, like there's someone out here. They're like, this is for me. DM Jen and let her know. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And feel free to reach out anyone listening. I'm always there and able to respond. Awesome. Have an amazing day. Jen. Yeah, you too. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye y'all. As queer women, that's women with an X, because of course we are inclusive here. As I was saying, as queer women, we haven't always been lifted up or celebrated. We have often felt left out and put down in places that historically haven't welcomed us. In fact, we have been conditioned by society to be grateful for mere tolerance. My resilient LGBTQ plus IA community, I am talking to you. I'll bet you've recognized the spark that God put in your heart your unique calling to impact the world in only a way that you can. You can. A business idea, a brand to build, a coaching program to start, the art to create, the song to sing, the book to write, that relationship you long to build. But that little light inside your soul has often been blown out by the people around you, leaving you conditioned to play small 
and not step into your full potential. You are not alone. And it's never too late to truly live your most authentic dream life. I would know. I came out late in life, nearly 30, a couple years ago after being bullied for months inside a country club. Right outside of my weights class, I was assaulted by a bigoted woman who couldn't stand my queerness. She physically pushed me, so I had a meeting with management. I told them I didn't feel safe. I brought forth evidence, and guess what? They did nothing. Sadly, this is normal, but in order to create change, we have to be brave enough to be the change ourselves. So I did a thing. I started my own virtual country club for queer women, a safe place for us to create meaningful connections and grow. So if you're looking for a love connection, networking opportunities, or coaching to live your best freedom life, you want to apply to be a part of our incredible community of purpose-driven, passionate queer women. Join Queer Women Rising, the online queer country club for growth-minded women ready to level up in life and love. To apply, DM me the word rising on Instagram at Sophia Spolino or chat me the word rising on sophiaspolino.com. Now, beyond hosting Queer Women Rising, I am a personal brand coach and social media strategist. If you give me a moment to tell you about what I do, I can share how I can help you, just like I've helped many clients before get famous online and make more money. If you're an exhausted coach or service provider, ready to scale your business for real, or you're just getting started building your dream brand from scratch, And if you're ready to build your own profitable personal brand, I can show you how in six months or less. But why should you take my word for it? Well, I've spent over 10 years in the social media marketing industry, amassing over 400,000 followers across platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube, as well as hosting a top charting podcast, building a successful service provider business, and coaching powerful women to build purpose-driven, profitable personal brands. Yeah, I have the social media and sales process strategies that can help you finally make the money you deserve. Because I want to help you build your dream business that gives you time, freedom, and makes real money. So for a limited time, I'm giving away your first steps to go from less than 5K months and advance to 10 to 20K months. Grab my newly revamped Profitable Personal Brand Blueprint, my proven framework to build yourself a personal brand that motivates, inspires, and sells so that your business can thrive the way it should. Just go to the link in the show notes. Whether you're a novice at creating or you're feeling stuck, hitting a plateau in your business that once had consistent revenue, and need guidance, support, and coaching to get to your next level, I invite you to book a strategy call to speak with either me or my team to see if we'd be the right fit to work with each other inside of the Profitable Personal Brand six-month coaching program. Mind you, I am extremely selective and this coaching program is not for everyone, and I'm not afraid to say it. I am only taking on serious, purpose-driven, and committed queer women and allies inside of my community. If that's you, book your free strategy call. The link is in the show notes. And if you feel yourself come alive and love listening to Queer Women Rising, please leave me a five-star rating with a kind review wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to share the show with a powerful woman you know. And remember, when you're called to do something greater in life, love, or business, you will be uncomfortable until you move. So get up and go get what you want. Let's rise.